we're both from uh, Samoana High School, and we're here to finish our physical test for joining in the army. I'm going for reserve and um, active, active duty. Yep. My family is, you know, facing some difficulties right now. Uh, a lot of financial problems, and plus, I always wanted to go to school after high school. So it's the only way I can go to school, you know, help me. They're gonna help me for my college things. Yeah, and to get and uh, offer my family a little help for their financial problems. <laughs> I joined to help my family, my parents, you know, and to go to school like what she said. Since 1900, when uh, we were ceded to the United States, we were a military island. Our territory is not like, uh, uh, Congress has not organized a government for the territory. We're still kind of in between. And uh, we're classified as an unincorporated and unorganized territory. Unorganized meaning that Congress still has not organized a formal government and unincorporated simply because uh, I don't think there's ever any indication that we will ever become uh, as a state of the Union as it was with other territories. Uh, I would say 99% of the American people don't know that American Samoa has had a, this year, will be uh, a 110 years of a very unique political relationship between our islands and the United States. We're the only people that have this uh, citizenship status as U.S. nationals, meaning that we're not U.S. citizens, but we're not aliens either, so kind of like in between. The churches is a big, big thing uh, in San Marcos. Everybody go to church back in the island. Everybody go to church. The church is a big support for our soldiers. I mean, well, one thing about Samoan is, like, almost every every Samoan is connected to almost every Samoan. Where you have like six degrees of separation, you know, in the world, Samoans have like maybe two point five. There is such a beautiful connection, partnership between the culture and the culture of the military. The Samoan child is raised to understand and appreciate and respect levels of authority, which um, is, is exactly what they step into and to the military. So I think once they get in, they have an understanding and most of them do extremely well because they find their niche. You have this, this very big warrior kind of culture, you know, someone's very um, physically tough. <laughs> For the infantry, I mean, that's perfect for them. Coming up the ranks and, and being, uh, having to follow by somebody else's orders. It's very common in Samoan culture too. Like, you know, you, it's not very individualistic. It's, um, we work as, as a community. The military, that's the, those same sort of things. I mean, you need compliance from everybody. You're swearing in to follow the commands of, you know, somebody else and you're, o you're always under somebody else's thumb and you're always under somebody else's orders. And like for Samoans, I think just being used to that in our culture, it, it, it helps them adjust a lot easier. And it, and it could be, you know, just the reason why so many Samoans opt for going into the military rather than um, exploring other options. One clap, two clap, two clap, all right. Aw, oh, man, I was doing a... Uh... Oh, 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 oh. Tell me what the dragon say! Arita, Arita! Tell me what my boss said! Arita! I was supposed to go to boot camp. I, when I went to boot camp, I had a, I had a blast. I see kids crying, quitting, and I was just like, I was loving it. Like we playing off the. I was scared all the time. Um, just we had a pugil sticks, we had hand to hand, and I just feel like someone's very physical that way. And they have this worst period. They like to be physical. They like to, you know, get hit and I don't know, challenge and be competitive. Not only are we athletic people,
people, but we're, we're born natural warriors. We're, we're, we're born soldiers. And for 50 years, we were administered by the Navy. The United States really needed a great coaling station or a, a safe harbor. What is now American Samoa was given to the United States and then formalized in 1900. The chiefs or the Matais in Tutuila and Aunu, those groups of islands, officially ceded the islands to the United States. Uh, and so if, from their perspective, it was a way to cement a relationship with a very powerful ally. The U.S. primary interest in the islands was military. It was not for love of the Samoan people. Let's be uh, realistic about that. So since 1900, Samoans were sort of tracked into, some of the best young men in Samoa were tracked into the military. Around 1971-72, a big push by the army to rebuild and to rebuild the volunteer army, they recruited heavily over here. September 2nd, 1980, uh, mission was to establish a provisional detachment of the Army Reserves, uh, which was an infantry unit belonging to the famous 100th Battalion, 442nd uh, Infantry. In February 99, again with a new mission to establish a new engineer unit and a new maintenance unit. The military is really strictly two considerations as far as these young people are concerned and their families is basically education and family support. And there's just no other two ways about it. There's not enough industry here to uh, stick around and looking for a job that pays that well. Of course we all have reasons, uh, some for economic reasons. Uh, some because of tradition, my father, my grandfather, great-grandfather was in the military. And it's, it's another important facet of our history and, and our relationship uh, with the military. Oh my chest, marching, standing proud. The soldiers come together like a family. family. Unity, look out for you and you look out for me. The soldiers come together like a family. family. Unity, look out for you and you look out for me. The economy is not really uh, doing so well at this point in, in time. And a lot of these people that uh, have been unemployed have no other way to uh, get themselves employable. So the government is, uh, is not hiring a lot of people. And the alternative is to go in the military, perhaps, you know, helping out with the families. The canneries had been the back, backbone of this economic development. Eighty percent of this economy depends on what happens in those canneries. There are probably at least two thousand jobs that are dependent on what may happen with the, uh, with the canneries. So if both canneries leave, that's how many people that may have to also have to go home because we can't afford to, to, to pay them. Right now, there's since the closure of Chicken of the Sea, uh, more than 2,000 people have lost their jobs. Military is a big element of my economic development. You know, I think the starting pay for a private is around $20,000, but it's if it's over 30, I'd be a little bit surprised. The average income in American Samoa is between like three and five thousand dollars a year, so you can multiply, and that's you know, it can be about eight times as much as the average income. I started promoting, you know, uh, military, not only as a career path, but also as a way of getting education, to furthering education for our students. We can only afford a few scholarships. We'll probably send uh, maybe 
one percent, if we're lucky, of all you know high school graduates to further their education. About four or five percent of them would go to the, our community college. Many of them do see it as an option. Those um, mainly a financial for financial purposes because the families are not able to afford off-island schooling. So they see it as a stepping stone to get them into the universities of their choice. We encourage them to go into the military with the idea of taking advantage of all the educational opportunities that are to offer. Uh, our ROTC uh, is, is divided into, into uh, two different categories or components you can see. One is JROTC, which is uh, high school. The other program is a senior ROTC, which is you're looking at a college level. And a lot of kids do join JROTC. It's an interesting class. Kids enjoy it because it's fun, it's different. It's military, you get to run, you get to wear, they show you uniforms, you get to learn military um, training and stuff like that. So military is highly influenced within uh, American Samoa. And we currently have um, 1,624 cadets, which is one of the largest junior ROTC program in, in the United States and the territories. In, in our junior ROTC program, our mission is to motivate young, young people to be better citizens. Uh, we, we do not sell the Army, but we also teach uh, dis discipline and esprit and teamwork and, and all that great stuff. Then having JROTC be such a strong presence, it does really just kind of corral you, in my opinion, into the military. Samoa has a very high rate of recruiting soldiers. Somehow we are, uh, last time I heard, we have more soldiers recruited out of this island alone per capita than any other place in the U.S. Well, you have to take the ASVAB test. It's an aptitude test to check knowledge. It has science, math, English, reading, and oh, mechanical, mechanical stuff. <laughs> Fly tech, all the stuff, yeah. They're gonna test you, and the average score for you to get in the Army is 31. 31? The ASVAB stands for the Armed Service Services Vocational Aptitude Battery. Students have a hard time even passing the ASVAB, which is a great deal easier than the SAT. It was very, very difficult, and we both thought that if a student here, a second language English speaker, got through the English, the cultural bias is very evident. Not intentionally, because it is geared toward American communities, but um, it is very difficult for the students here to pass. We were not raised in Montana or in Seattle, so to speak, you know, the way you speak, but we tried to learn the language and the it takes uh, a little while for us to absorb the information. More Salmons enter in infantry, so they're grunts. Um, but, you know, some people will say, I think um, Congressman Falama Vayenga said that um, some Salmons want to do that. You know, they're that gung ho and they want to be at that level. Um, you know, I guess it's, you can decide if people want to be at that level or if that's the level that they're just coming into. A lot of people ask me, because um, I've never been deployed yet, they're like, oh, so I've been deployed. I'm like, no, and they ask me, oh, do you want me to be deployed? In a way, I do, because I feel like I'm in the military now. If I ever never do get deployed while there's a war going on, I would feel like I'm not, you know, serving my country, doing my duty. <laughs> and because we're an island that even if we're not related you know we may have known that person. The casualty rates in Samoa um, 
you know, again, going back to just that notion of family and everybody being connected and everybody knowing who their family is and who they're related to and almost everything can connect you to another someone. When one someone dies, it's like, you know, the whole nation, someone's from, from those that are on the rock and those um, here in the States, you feel it. It's like, you know, it's a, it's a large impact. Another really sad fact that's a sad fact that I don't think anyone talks about enough in general is just PTSD after people leave. And because um, a lot of these young soldiers uh, enter the military and serve with maybe not even their friends, but like their cousins or their siblings, their rate of PTSD is incredibly high. Um, and the level of healthcare in general, um, not to mention mental health care in American Samoa is, is, is low. He was in 205 or 6, I went with him to Iraq. He got hit by an IED. His sergeant got killed. His gunner got hurt. And he was the driver. There was a lot of rumors that went around his committed suicide. Mm -hmm. That's what PTSD is doing to a lot of these soldiers. If they're not getting that help that they really need right away, that's what's happening with a lot of our soldiers. They're not getting that professional help. None at all. PTSD. <clears throat> The soldier has that. My job as a warrior family assistant, you see that list up on the board? Mm -hmm. Those are all the soldiers I'm trying to get to Hawaii for that. PTSD, TPI, traumatic brain injury, and all the injuries that they occurred when they were in 205 and 06 in Iraq. I mean, they haven't been treated since now. Mm -hmm. have the highest casualty rate per capita but uh, <clears throat> I also think I think that uh, it's not that uh, you know some ones would like to die more than other <laughs> other groups but it has it speaks for the amount of the number of some ones who are in the military <laughs> She was only 22 when she died. We buried her on the 3rd of January, and she was 23 on the 8th. The January 8th was her birthday. And we, we're an island, we're a territory to the U.S., but we have the most number of deaths uh, con considering the U.S. is a large, um, but American Samoa has contributed a lot of lives to the world. I don't stop them from what they want to do. If this is what they want, we we'll serve their country the best way they know how. And that's how Tina, Tina was. People came, came down, newspaper people, they all came down and talked to us about it. I told them it's what she wanted, you know, freedom. A week after we buried her, after we had the birthday for her, we made the cake and, and, and sang happy birthday ice cream. We went to the, the post office and we got a postcard from her. This was before she went to the...
she wrote a postcard before she went on her last convoy. And it had something at the end to say that I am the way I am because of you too. <laughs> and she started me crying again. She's named after my mom, Tina. Now, I think the problem that we're having is not so much the United States taking advantage of, of Samoa, but the problem is we're too small. And we're just, we just don't matter in terms of national policies. Out of sight, out of mind. And we're just, we just don't have the kind of clout in terms of national policies that uh, makes us an influence. And uh, we make a lot of noise, but we're not being heard.